Good morning. Thank you for joining us for our Quantarian Solutions webinar. Today's webinar will cover how to get you on a pathway to a successful cybersecurity career. My name is Joe Caroli, and I'm the Director of Cybersecurity and Information Systems Programs at Quantarian Solutions. I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. Before proceeding to the webinar, I'd like to say a few brief words about Quantarian. Quantarian is a small business located in New York, Utica, New York, that specializes in high quality analytical services, products and training across a number of technical disciplines. Those disciplines include cybersecurity and information assurance, reliability, maintainability, and quality, software development and engineering, and information technology. Quantarian Solutions is a registered Cybersecurity Awareness Month champion, and we are sharing cybersecurity resources to promote the awareness of online safety and privacy throughout the month of October. Our staff is comprised of subject matter experts from various technical disciplines. The diversity of their expertise allows the organization to address a wide range of technologies while also facilitating develop the development of innovative and cross-domain solutions to complex technical challenges. You can learn more about Quantarian Solutions Incorporated at www.quantarian.com. You will also find today's webinar slides on our website. I'd like to express my sincere appreciation to all of you for taking time out to join us today for this exciting and very relevant topic. A few administrative notes before we begin. Please note that all of the attendees' lines have been muted. If you have any questions during the webinar, we ask you to submit them using the attendee chat box you can see at the bottom of the screen. It's the Q&A folder icon button. Today we have the privilege of hosting three seasoned cybersecurity professionals. Mr. John Check from Raytheon, Mr. Tony Anscombe from ESET, and Mr. Ryan Callumber from Proofpoint. We'd like to start by first turning to Mr. John Check. Mr. Check is a Senior Director of Cybersecurity Protection Solutions for Raytheon Intelligence and Space. John joined Raytheon from CSRA, where he was the Vice President of their Digital Solutions Organization. John also served as Vice President of the Solutions Organization at Computer Sciences Corporation, North American Public Sector. In addition, Mr. Check worked at IBM where he was an Executive Operations Manager. John Check holds a Bachelor of Arts in Environmental Sciences from the University of Virginia. John, please start by telling us in your opinion what cybersecurity is, what it means to different people, and how it relates to non-cybersecurity professionals. Well, thanks, Joe. Thank you for Quinterian uh, for hosting this today. Really delighted to have this opportunity. Um, you know, when it comes down to cybersecurity, it's all about protecting networks and devices and the data that resides on it. Ultimately, the data is the key, and cybersecurity is about ensuring that anybody that wants to access that data, whether it's like my kids for gaming or in a work setting to to you know run the business, or from a government perspective to be able to uh, support the constituents that the, that the government provides services to. It's all about ensuring that people can get to the services they need to online uh, through a digital means, and it's all about securing the data. Uh, when it comes to what does it mean to different people, kind of like I mentioned, you know, cybersecurity to my kids means, you know, they're, they're, they see it in the sense of, okay, has somebody stolen my credentials to whatever gaming site I'm a part of? You know, it comes to my mom, it's, you know, she gets, she's been the, you know, you know, been under attack around smishing attacks, people trying to get her banking information. And for me, outside of my day job, uh, you know, it impacted me where my uh, local doctor was a victim of a ransomware and their phone system was down for two months. So, you know, when people think about it, it's really, I think people still think about cybersecurity and how it affects them directly. But also, when you're a cybersecurity professional, you really think about, okay, how does it, you know, how does it really drive protecting you know, our, our, our nation, our way of life, and all the things people take for granted. Uh, and it's, and one, the interesting things about cybersecurity, what makes people successful in cybersecurity is really, they can come from any walk of life and be successful in cybersecurity. It's the person that wants to continually learn, the inquisitive mind, um, and it's really focused on how do you ensure that you stay relevant in something that's always changing and really demystifying it. One of the things with cybersecurity, you know, people hear that and think, well, wow, that must be really complicated, or it sounds really, sounds difficult. But it's like anything else, once you get into it and, and start learning 
a lot of the same principles apply, right? You have to continuously, you know, update your skills. You can, you can come from anything, like you mentioned, Joe, my background, I'm an environmental science major, right? You don't have to be classically trained necessarily, and it doesn't have to be your first career. If you're changing careers, you know, it can, and, you know everybody is welcome in the cyber uh, world, right? Anybody was welcome to join, and that's what it's going to take for all of us to, to address the challenge that we have. Thank you, John. V very insightful answer. Next, we'd like to turn to Mr. Tony Anscombe. Tony Anscombe is the Global Security Evangelist for ESET. With over 20 years of security industry experience, Mr. Anscombe is an established author, blogger, and speaker on the current threat landscape, security technologies and products, data protection, privacy, trust, and internet safety. His speaking portfolio includes presentations at numerous industry conferences, including RSA, Black Hat, VB, CTIA, MEF, Gartner Risk and Security Summit, and the Child Internet Safety Summit. He is regularly quoted in security technology and business media, including BBC, The Guardian, The New York Times, and the US, TA, the US Today. Mr. Anscombe also has broadcast experiences on Bloomberg, BBC, CTV, K-Ron, and CBS. Mr. Anscombe, in your opinion, how would you describe the convergence of privacy and cybersecurity? Please discuss where there, there are overlaps and how they are different. Well, firstly, Joe, uh, thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you for inviting me along to be a panelist today. And the convergence of cybersecurity and privacy it's really interesting to have just listened to what John said, because actually, I think John kind of touched on the fact that privacy is part of security anyway, because he talked about you know, somebody maybe stealing a gaming profile. Yeah, you know, the security is there to protect is to protect you know, stealing the gaming profile. The actual profile is the privacy. It's personal. Inf it probably contains personal information and therefore the person wants to keep it private, not only because it's an asset, but because it's got that personal information in it as well. So these two are converging very quickly. And as we think about our own interactions as consumers with businesses, and then we consider it from the business perspective as well, you know, we hand over our data, the company stores our data or keeps it for certain purposes. And when these two come together, uh, it's important that companies put the right security practices in place and if, in certain places in the world and certain places here in the US, you see privacy legislation actually forcing companies to put the right security measures in place to protect that personal information that would be a privacy breach if that personal information was actually leaked. So these two are coming together very much. So I, don't, I think it's actually difficult to separate the two terms anymore. Yeah, you know, when somebody's talking about cyber security, it's actually the security around protecting networks and such like, but primarily it's around protecting data. And that data is, I would say, more, more very commonly inclusive of personal information, which therefore acts in privacy. We also think of privacy from another angle as well, though, about, you know, are these websites tracking me, et cetera? Are the cable companies getting my browsing history and such like? And, but again, that's personal data. So yeah, I think privacy is quite wide ranging and security is certainly encompassing uh, privacy and other things as well today. Excellent, thank you very much, Tony, very insightful. So last, but certainly not least, before we proceed with our Bain presentation, I would like to introduce our third panel member, Mr. Ryan Kallenberg. Mr. Kallenberg has over 15 years of experience in the information security industry. He currently leads cybersecurity strategy for Proofpoint and is a sought after expert for leadership and commentary on breaches and best practices. Ryan leads a global team of security experts and marketers who ensure that Proofpoint's customer have consistent insight on today's advanced attacks and how to protect their people, data, and brands. Ryan, please tell us in your opinion how you see the current need for cybersecurity professionals throughout industry, government, and academia? Uh, really good question, Joe. And I think a lot of people in the Q&A are asking the same question. Uh, ultimately, though, you, you think about 
the emergence of the demand for cyber professionals, and you can't think about it in a vacuum. It's happening with all sorts of other developments in concert. At this point in time, cybersecurity is probably the only area in which effectively every single American business is under attack by criminals pretty much all day, every day. Uh, and the expertise to actually deal with that is shockingly poorly distributed across the workforce. Uh, this has got a couple of reasons uh, that are worth at least understanding historically. I would point out the, the first one, getting into cybersecurity from the outside seems bizarre. Like you look at the, the uh, even the pop culture versions of cybersecurity and they're not terribly helpful in trying to figure out what this whole space is about. Uh, actually, you go back to the 90s and watch the movie Hackers, it's probably a little bit more accurate than watching NCIS or any of the other ways that things are depicted here. And that is because you know, cybersecurity basically emerged in two ways. Uh, it emerged as an industry. Uh, my bio is a little out of date. I got into cybersecurity in 1999, so I'm, I'm working on year 22. But at that point in time, it was a barely functional industry. There were a couple companies working on things like firewalls. You know, military and government definitely had made some progress in cybersecurity, but anybody who told you that they had spent 10 years working on cybersecurity was either lying or they were in government, uh, most likely the military. At this point in time, though, it started to merge with this really interesting group of people who were just interested in problems around cybersecurity. They might have been interested in getting access to things that weren't totally legal. Uh, they might not look like your average uh, polished white collar professional. They might be showing up at events like Black Hat in Las Vegas. But that part of cybersecurity merged with the industry over the years to kind of create the job landscape that we see today. That's a really useful thing to understand when you think about today where cyber professionals are not necessarily those from either scene because the world has changed so much. There are cyber professionals that work on issues of awareness training that don't have any technical backgrounds of any kind. You know, John mentioned he's an environmental science uh, major. I majored in history and computer science. Uh, it doesn't really matter what field you're from, and it doesn't matter whether you own a hoodie. It doesn't matter whether you know how to code. There's lots and lots of ways for cybersecurity to create opportunity, not just in the private sector, where, frankly, the private sector should probably do a little bit better job of not screening out so many uh, people because there are literally millions of unfilled job requisitions for cybersecurity professionals at this point, but also academia and government. I would actually say the easiest place, though, to get a first leg up, the first rung on the ladder, so to speak, is almost undoubtedly the private sector, particularly now. Organizations support work from anywhere. Everybody is absolutely dying for people. And a bare minimum of uh, familiarity with the basic concepts of cybersecurity can definitely get you that first job. And from there, the possibilities are pretty limitless. Very good. Thank you, Ryan. Now, all three very excellent and insightful responses. I could see we're going to have a, a very informative webinar today. So let's start with our first topic where we're going to turn it over to the presenters to answer the questions in a panel fashion. So, the, so we know that, as, as Ryan just mentioned, there are so many jobs in the cybersecurity field, so many technical careers to pursue in general, and cybersecurity is a very hot one with some of the big firms and banks are literally paying millions of dollars, not to individual cybersecurity specialists, but overall millions of dollars per year to protect, actually hundreds of millions of dollars per year in some instances to protect their networks and assets. So there are many jobs and companies just cannot keep up with demand. So let's ask our panel to briefly discuss why would one consider a career in, in cybersecurity? So please go ahead and, and take it from their panel. Sure, I'll jump in. So you know, I mean, the number one reason for me in a cybersecurity career is it's exciting. There, it's always changing. There's always something to learn. You, you, you're in the, you're, you know, my wife likes to say, you're in my top five news stories of the day, again, not for all of them, no, not for any of the right reasons, right, from, the, from a cybersecurity you know, event happening somewhere. Um, but it's really, for me, it's, it, there's lots of opportunity, and Ryan touched on it, and one thing, he said, you don't need to have a hoodie, but if you attend an event, you'll probably walk away with one. Somebody will try to hand you a hoodie and turn your way out of the event <laughs> to indoctrinate you. 
But, you know, it's really all about opportunity, opportunity to learn new things in a dynamic career. And really, uh, typically in the cyber culture, right, it welcomes everyone. And that's, a, that's not, this, you can't say that for all types of industry, but certainly in cyber, because they're, you know, for one thing, like, like Brian mentioned, there's such a need for people. Everyone that wants to raise their hand and say, hey, I want to learn, companies will find a way to train those folks and get them the tools they need to be successful. Yeah, I'll, I'll add that one of the key reasons to consider a career like this is because it is a morally good thing to do. Uh, the people that make money on cybercrime are some of the worst people on planet Earth. Uh, you have this funding uh, drugs, it's funding human trafficking, it's tied in with prostitution, uh, all kinds of things. Uh, and actually, it, w one of the more interesting ways that we saw this manifest itself recently is a crew that we actually had been tracking at Proofpoint uh, that worked on a scam that the FBI calls business email compromise, where they're basically taking over people's email accounts, trying to figure out when money is moving from one place to another, and then send a fake message to try and redirect it to themselves. Turned out to actually be the Camorra, which uh, is the uh, organized crime organization in Naples, a uh, little bit less famous than their siblings down in Sicily, the mafia. But still, it's, uh, it's pretty extraordinary the uh, degree to which this really enriches awful, awful people. And uh, if you care about the uh, future of America, certainly uh, as many of our, our key adversaries geopolitically, you know, North Korea is effectively funding its government through cybercrime at this point, which is an absolutely wild thing to say. So this is something that if, if it doesn't get you at least uh, excited from an economic standpoint, and it should, uh, I do want to add a little angle to uh, Joe's point. Uh, the chief information security officers of many of those banks that uh, you're referring to actually do make millions of dollars every year. Uh, <laughs> I, I know many of them, they're friends, they're, they're doing well. Uh, and, and even lower down uh, on that particular ladder, uh, people are doing quite well. Uh, yes, it's a, it's a nine-figure expenditure for, for most large uh, global banks at this point in time. So I, I would just add to, to what John said, if, if you care about stopping the bad guys, and you don't want to be a cop, you don't want to join the military, cybersecurity is a great way to do that uh, and, uh, and does not involve the same level of physical risk as some other careers that have an equivalent amount, I think, of moral positive impact on the world. So Ryan and John, you, you just highlighted some good points there. And Ryan, you know, the money is always important, I think, in there. And if somebody was asking me which, which career could, uh, could bring in some riches as doing it in the morally correct way, you know, cybersecurity is certainly one of them because there is a mass shortage of people and good talent in the cybersecurity industry. So therefore, salaries tend to be higher. And obviously, that should attract some good people into the, into the industry. But that shouldn't be the only reason. As you mentioned, you know, having the right moral standpoint and wanting to do good is super important, but I think I broaden this out slightly. You know, I've been in the the cybersecurity industry either directly or, or attached to it since early '90s uh, by working for banks and looking at data back then. It, you know, cybersecurity was there then, or security was around how you store that data and what you do with information. So, I believe we're in a digital revolution, and actually being part of that revolution. Uh, and how to actually make sure that that revolution, we come out at the other end in good shape, which is what cybersecurity is doing, making sure that things are done in the right way, making sure they're secure, making sure people's privacy is, is adhered to, and making sure that you know the bad guys aren't monetizing from information or attacks and such like. That's, part, that's a very much key role in this digital revolution. And I say, we're, we're in it. I think you know, we are still in the start of this. You know, we're 30, maybe 30 years into it. You know, when you look at the Industrial Revolution and other things that have happened in history, these things last 50 to 100 years, not five or 10 years. So I think shaping that and being part of it is, is super important. Now, I will leave you with one thing that a friend of mine often says, because he watches cybersecurity people often travel a lot as well, going off around the world, doing different things, going to different conferences and such like. Yeah, he always jokes, join the cybersecurity industry and see the world. So there's another reason for you as well. That's great, Tony. That's, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And I think, you know, one, one thing just to add to what Ryan said, 
you know, cybersecurity is not a fad. This is a career that's going to be out there for a long time because the number one reason is there's no winning the cyber war, right? There's not, there's not an end to this, right? It's about persisting our, our fight and defending our way of life for as long as we can, the best we can. And it's not, it's not something that's going to go away anytime soon. Yeah, and, and it's probably important to understand cybersecurity, yeah, jobs in the cybersecurity industry range from somebody analyzing log files all day long, all the way through to, you know, the three of us sitting here on this panel. But I mean, there, there are so many, there are so, it is such a diverse industry. You can work for yeah, a cybersecurity vendor, uh, creating great products and technology and innovating great ideas. You could go work for in a corporate side and you know, be on the operational side of securing people's data. You could go work in a government sector. You could go work in a school. I mean, schools have huge requirement for cybersecurity because of student data and such like. So I think there's such a wide, diverse industry in amongst there uh, and so much opportunity also to switch between them, um, as I would assume probably the three of us have done. Um, and, and John and Ryan have, have shared that they have degrees in, in other things. I don't have a degree. I come from an environment where actually where I could program in Cobol and Fortran and have no college degree and have come into cybersecurity. And it's an accepting industry. I'm not saying today that that's, that's super possible to do that type of thing. But you know, if you have a talent and you have a passion around this, there's a home for you in the cybersecurity industry. Yeah, that's a great point. And that home may, might be re literally anywhere. Uh, something that I'll throw out to everyone. You know, in my own career, uh, I started on the practitioner side and have moved like uh, Tony and John to the, uh, the vendor side, as we would call it. Uh, but I also uh, moved to Europe for a very long chunk of my career as part of this. And if you want to basically take uh, the US cybersecurity industry and roll it back a few years, uh, you can effectively do that by simply traveling to another place. Uh, the, uh, the skills that you learn that are maybe a couple years ahead, the types of technologies that you're going to see deployed are not evenly distributed around the world. And there are lots of uh, places where cybersecurity talent is even more short than it is in the United States. Uh, and so if you are uh, willing to you know, co-op that Navy slogan and see the world, you know, uh, the first uh, security operations center I ever built was in Lima, Peru, of all places. Uh, and in order to staff it, I actually uh, went to the local university, the Universidad de Lima, taught an incident response course and tried to get students who were not majoring in anything technical, just vaguely interested in cybersecurity and ended up hiring them into the bank to run the SOC. This is the sort of thing that I think, you know, there are lots of people uh, asking questions around, you know, am I studying the right things? Am I doing the right certifications? Am I, am I in the right programs? The answer is almost assuredly yes, because there's no right answer. You don't have to check a bunch of very particular boxes to fit into this industry. I will say our industry has not done a great job of diversity, equity, and inclusion over the years. And we have tended to write job descriptions in exclusionary ways. So if you are looking for a job, a first job in one of the main ways, you know, looking at indeed.com or looking at you know, all, all of the classic job posting websites that every single organization has, it's easy enough to find with Google. Uh, I wouldn't be deterred just because you don't check every box. If you meet a hiring manager who understands that you're passionate about this, that you want to be a cybersecurity professional, most of us, I think, even if we are very bad at writing job descriptions, are open to smart people, capable people who care about solving this problem, even if they come from a non-traditional background, uh, like, frankly, most of us in the industry do. Ryan, I think your answer to that question was a very good segue into our second topic today. So I'd like to move to the second topic. And I, we're seeing a lot of good questions come in with regard to preparing for cybersecurity careers. So the second topic is how does one prepare for a career in cybersecurity? So I'll start off by saying there are hundreds or probably thousands of educational programs these days that are focused on cybersecurity and computer science and computer information security types of degrees. And of course there are so many certifications out there 
CISSP and Security Plus, and uh, we have certifications for managers, certifications for IT staff, certifications for system administrators, and, and so forth. So it seems like we have a lot of interest in this topic, and I'm guessing a lot of students are with us today. So let me turn it over to the panel to discuss how does one prepare for a cybersecurity career? So let me step in first, Joe. Um, well, obviously you turn down your lights, you put your hoodie on and sit behind a dark screen. But no, on a serious note, it's, it's not like that at all. Uh, now, interestingly, I recently spoke to uh, at ESET, we have a, 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 a scholarship fund every year where we help certain students entering the cybersecurity education process. And I recently spoke to somebody that had been through that process and been one of our, our scholarship recipients. And it was interesting to hear her experience of then entering the workplace because she's now, you know, she's now out there, got a job and whatever, and is doing very well, which is great. But she hit a barrier. And I, and I think it's important to share this barrier with everybody because what she found was having the degree was one thing, but what actually most employers were looking for in the corporate world. So if you want to go into the end user side of the business is a CISSP. So you need a recognized qualification that's seen by companies further to the degree. So just bear that in mind that a degree is only part of the education. Um, the other thing I'd say is, is make sure you go off and you start actually interacting with some of the for, great forums and, and pa uh, panel uh, you know, forums and communities that are out there online. Because what you'll find is, and this is one of the things I love about the cybersecurity industry, is it's a community. And everybody in this community actually shares. Uh, where even across competing companies, you will find cybersecurity people sharing information because we all have one very specific goal in, uh, that we want to achieve. And that is actually to stop the bad guys and to do the morally right thing. And people are very open to that. So if you're part of that conversation and you're part of that community, I think that would help you massively when, uh, in, when trying to actually enter the job market. I'll add a couple of points on kind of what a cyber career can look like. Uh, they don't all look technical. Yes, there's a shortage of technical uh, skills. There are shortage of people with technical skills to sit in things like security operations centers, uh, which uh, many of us did in the early stages of our careers. You look at a, uh, well, it's probably a GUI at this point in time, and you are uh, very, very, very deep in the weeds <laughs> in a lot of those kind of stereotypical first jobs in cybersecurity. However, there are a lot of first jobs in cybersecurity that look nothing like that whatsoever. Uh, if you want to get into a sales career, for example, uh, cybersecurity is a wonderful place to do that. There are thousands of cybersecurity startups that are trying to figure out how to get their message across to the cybersecurity professionals that are buying those products. That is, in fact, one of the better ways to make money in cybersecurity is being very, very good at helping people solve their problems by selling them products, services, and technology. It's something that we should not shun. It's an important part of the industry. And it's something that a lot of people whose skills tend towards the more interpersonal and less technical can absolutely use as a lever into a cybersecurity career. Uh, the other thing you can think about is you know, even engineering careers don't always start with writing code. I, I think a lot of people um, get a little discouraged when they see uh, the litany of certifications that we often ask for in job descriptions when really, and I'm going to be honest with this one, maybe I disagree with Tony a bit. I, I got my CISSP in 2001. I stopped paying for the annual uh, renewal probably a decade ago. Uh, it was, a, I think, a useful signal uh, that I had it, some idea what I was talking about in cybersecurity early in my career. Uh, certifications can be a racket, though, too. Uh, they're not always reflective of actual skill and actual knowledge. So you can use them where you need to to try and get in the door in certain places, but they are not a great predictor of whether somebody's actually good at cybersecurity, I have found. 
so piling up the certifications, while that might be a natural thing to do to try and advance, is not always the way to success in cybersecurity. So I would look broadly, consider a career if in cybersecurity sales, consider a career that is not a purely technical one just to get into this industry. And I mentioned this before, you know, it's Security uh, Awareness Month, Cybersecurity Awareness Month. There are lots of people in this industry whose chief skills are about trying to convince people to pay attention to cybersecurity. And awareness training is a job that literally every large company has. And it's a totally different skill set. You don't need to know how to script. You don't need to know how to deobfuscate code. You, you just need to know how to talk to people and teach them. And so there's lots and lots of angles to take on a cybersecurity career. And your own path to prepare for that will probably be unique. But don't limit yourself to those purely technical, purely certification-oriented paths if that's not what you're good at. Yeah, I'll jump in and be the arbiter from Ryan and Tony. So clearly, you know, depending on the role, that's what gets you in the door. But like Ryan said, you know, what you actually, your uh, proficiency at learning new skills is critical and how well you engage in a team environment because cybersecurity, no one does it alone. You have to, you, you work in a part of a team always. You want to engage with the team because you're not continuously learning from the people around you the community that you have to engage in, Tony hit on it, I totally agree with him. You, I mean, best thing you do to prepare for cybersecurity, start engaging in the cyber community now. It, everybody will welcome you. Just jump in with both feet, don't be frightened. Ask the crazy question, ask what all the three letter acronyms are so you can create your little three letter acronym decoder ring to understand the lingo. Don't be afraid to ask, people will be happy to answer the questions. And it's really, uh, you know, certainly when, when, we're look, when I'm looking for people for our team, we have certain contractual requirements sometimes that require people to have CISSP or other certifications. And so it's certainly a way to show signal that you care about cybersecurity in the sense that you've taken the time to get the certifications that show that you have a, a foundational understanding of certain things. But really it's all about applying that learning. That's the key for us. And that's what really differentiates people is really applying that learning and be willing to learn new things uh, continuously because that's what it takes and it's a it's a wide open field there's so many different uh, opportunities in cyber Ryan hit on almost all of them right gave you a great overview of it, it pretty much any job you can think of there's a job related to that in cyber because cyber security touches all industries and when you think of it in that terms right it really is wide open and you might, you might think you're going to be a strictly technical person. Maybe you end up in a, in a sales job. Maybe vice versa. You, you're a salesperson and start being the, the sales engineer and then get to a purely technical role and start developing product. Right? It can go all different directions. And that's one of the great things about cybersecurity with all the opportunity and a, a field that's not going away anytime soon. You can take different career paths to stay fresh, try different things. And it's really a, an environment where you know, everybody says fail fast and you can try something new. Within cybersecurity, you can do that. You have a great opportunity to do that across multiple roles across the industry. Okay, gentlemen. So I'm going to mix it up a little bit here. A lot of the discussion on the second topic preempted some of the questions that our attendees asked. And there are some other questions that are very much directly related to what you just said. So I'm going to mix it up and ask a few questions from our present from our attendees right now. So we, we talked a lot about certifications. One of the attendees asked, are certifications one and done? Or do you have to keep do you have to keep paying for them as um, the years go on? You don't have to. I stopped. But no, you do, <laughs> they do cost money if you want to maintain them. And you're also required to uh, do what are called CPEs, which basically continuing education that you're demonstrating you're doing as part of maintaining most of the certificates. Uh, so the, the, I, I think the vast majority of cybersecurity certif certifications don't require you to retest at any point in time uh, unless you allow your certification to lapse. But there might be a few that I'm not familiar with that do. I would just add, it really depends on your role and your goals, right? If, if, if you have a, a, a job role that requires 
certifications to maintain that job or your goals in your career say to get that next job i know one of the gating factors is i have to have certain certifications then you should do it I mean, it really it's one of those things you have to think about uh as you approach your cybersecurity career as to what are some of the goals you have what are some of the roles and, and, and within any role there, there are however however high or low the, the hurdles you have to climb over to get into that role there are certain things to get into the door in, in, in jobs right and depending on what the role is those can be high hurdles or they can be very low and i just think that when you consider certifications you know to get into some of the the frontline jobs of cybersecurity, like Ryan kind of mentioned around SOCs or, you know, uh, incidents, incident response, you know, threat hunting, et cetera, probably do need some of those things to get into the door. And once you get in there, you can make your career path and decide what's right for you. Well, and just to add to what Ryan and John have said is most employers, if they're requiring or value the certification, they'll probably step in and help you fund and give you time to go and not, not the recertifications, because as Ryan mentioned, I, I can't think of one that has recertification, but there's this ongoing CPE credit so that you're showing that you're continually learning. Yeah, any employer who is looking at those certifications as part of that entry point will actually give you the time to go and continue the learning because it's in their benefit. And I, they actually want to know the latest things that are happening, the latest risk in their business, et cetera. So it's in their interest to actually keep you relevant as well. So I think most employers would actually step in and help you. Yeah, agreed. And I, I think there are a lot of questions around kind of how do you just take the first step? And a lot of the certification, certification questions are about that. And a lot of the questions in the chat are about that. I think I would actually advise a couple of things. Don't solely consider traditional pathways. Yes, you can absolutely apply to jobs. And yes, cybersecurity industry jobs are wide open on the vendor side, on the government side, and on the private sector side. But we, I think, as an industry, have been very bad at you know, creating artificial barriers and keeping some people that could contribute a lot to the industry out because they don't fit into traditional backgrounds. I would actually uh, recommend just reaching out to people directly. Cybersecurity is incredibly active on Twitter, for example, um, LinkedIn as well. And there are lots of people in the industry who do want to see uh, people be able to get their first step, their first job, whatever that happens to be. And there's a lot of different options for that first rung on the ladder. Uh, I, would, I would actually advise everybody to not again, to use just this one paved road that seems like it's sitting in front of you. There are dirt paths off every single side. People want to be mentors. People want to help uh, those who are not, you know, steeped in cybersecurity, you know, get into this world. So reaching out can never hurt. You know, the, the worst is that somebody doesn't reply to your DM. Don't worry about it. Move on to the next one. Yeah, Ryan, um, one of the attendees asked, what if they have, experience with cybersecurity, but only from an academic perspective, only that they gained in their studies, but not in a professional manner. So, or maybe someone who went to a boot camp but has no professional experience. And one of the things I think about is um, internships. You know, various government, industry, and academia organizations do offer internships. But if you could, gentlemen, could please comment on you know, an entry level just out of school. I know about the theory from an Ivy Tower perspective of cybersecurity, but I don't have any experience. What do I do next? Or where do I start? I'll jump in. So one of the, that's one of the, you know, the, the self-selecting criteria out. I don't have the experience. So I'm not going to apply for this job. Well, you know what, when, when, when I'm hiring entry level people, I know they don't have certain experiences. So when you get into that interview or that job, that, 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 that interview process, Embrace that, right? I don't, I, I might not have this, but here are the old things I've done. Here are the communities I participate in. Here's the, the groups I follow. Here's the, 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 the blog posts I read. That shows that you're really engaged. And so think about changing the conversation to the, from the, hey, I don't have to, here's what I am doing. And here's why you, should, you need to look at me because I care, I'm participating. I know what's happening. And I might not have the specific experience of doing two years of X, but I'm doing everything I can to get there. And so when I'm looking, when I'm interviewing people, I know they don't, with their entry level job or their career changing careers, 
they don't have certain experiences. And so if you get into a place where those are the questions, try to change the conversation. And if you can't, maybe that's not the right place and go to the next one because there will, there will be a next one. Don't self-select out, don't get frustrated because there are plenty of opportunities. Yeah, and, and Sarah's got an interesting question. Again, uh, she's working on her master's in cyber focused on forensics and policy. I would actually say the policy jobs are gonna be harder to get <laughs> if you're thinking about that. There are absolute blinking red light shortages of people who can do digital forensics and incident response work right now. Uh, if you understand that conceptually, even if you've never used a, you know, NCASE or FTK or any of the actual tools that most of us who, who have done digital forensics in the past uh, kind of uh, used on a day-to-day -day basis, you're, you're going to intuitively understand what the what the process is like, and whether that is uh, you know Mandiant, Microsoft, CrowdStrike, a million other smaller organizations, everybody is trying to hire. And uh, internships are are great. There are work study programs. We do both at, at Proofpoint to try and get people in from non traditional backgrounds. Uh, also, I think again, this is this is as much about the cybersecurity industry as as you all. You know, we are trying to do more in terms of showing up with uh, under historically underrepresented groups in cybersecurity. Uh, there are lots of white men in cybersecurity. That's not a, a surprise. There are fewer people of color. There are fewer people from non-traditional backgrounds. And uh, we are, at least at Proofpoint, I know a lot of other companies are doing this too. We're trying to spend more time at HBCUs, recruiting from there, and again, not erect these artificial walls and barriers for people who are just trying to get into the game to begin with. So Sarah, particularly, I would recommend trying to find something on the forensic side that is a great career path and learning that hands-on stuff. You can do anything after that. Uh, I did incident response early in my career, and that was just such a valuable way to understand what cyber security was actually all about uh, because you, you do an incident and then you have to describe that to executives. Like what happened? Why did it happen? Why, what are we gonna do so that it doesn't happen again? And thinking through all of that really does kind of touch on all of the things that you need to understand to get to the next couple of levels in, in that particular career path. Ryan, once again, you're a great straight man to move us into our, our next topic. Uh, and you did that by discussing some of the aspects of cybersecurity careers. So we're going to talk about the third topic. And um, as we've, as you have probably gleaned from listening today, cybersecurity is a very broad area with many experts. And, and I think it might be safe to say that no one person knows everything about the entire cybersecurity field. It's just so broad. If you look at the CISSP study guide, there's multiple areas within cybersecurity including things like risk management, um, asset security, how, how do we secure our communications and networks, um, identity management, asset management. Some people are involved with security testing, others with design methods on how to kind of bake in cybersecurity. So the third topic is what can one expect to encounter in a cybersecurity career? It's somewhat of a loaded question because the, the field is so broad. But let me turn that over to the panelists to discuss for a few moments. Thank you. So let me let me step in uh, uh, step in there. So one thing, if you uh, if you go out and socialize in a group of people that are not from the cybersecurity industry, one thing you can certainly expect from the career is when somebody says, "What do you do?" and you say, "Cybersecurity." They'll they'll edge away from you and and because you're in a you're in that black box of complicated complex stuff that actually they probably don't understand. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of jesting there because actually what can you expect from it? You can expect huge reward because if I go back to actually the very first comment that John made was it's somebody on the moral doing morally the right thing, and cybersecurity is actually about that because something you do today may actually stop something tomorrow or you might be involved in actually stopping something that's happening in real time or or you might be involved even in for example when one company acquires another company it, cyber security people will get involved in the acquisition of the other company because that acquisitions team will ask them to go and 
validate that the company is secure or business or a business partnership is secure or such like there's so many wide differing opportunities in the cyber security industry and you can move from one to the other as long as you're a motivated person and you can put things into i would say understandable language so that when you're talking to the end user or you're talking to somebody outside of the industry yeah they can actually understand what you know what you're talking about what the risk is and what the business may need to do yeah we are becoming ingrained in the business if we just take the last 18 months you know that the pandemic period when when lockdown happened in most countries at the start of last year most businesses turned to the cyber security team and that's because all those remote workers and all the children that went home to to work uh, do their schoolwork from home they needed to do it securely and it showed just how important that cyber security is in today's world and how actually it's at the core of every business rather than that um, strange looking group of people up on you know, one part of the floor of a, of a building and i think that's important you can you can expect to i think be valued uh, and get great reward from it personal reward One thing uh, I've met maybe to, to expect in a career, but one thing to keep in mind and, 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 and moderate is really, you know, one of the key things with having a career where there's lots happening and lots of change and things can be very pressure packed, right? When something bad is happening, right? Cybersecurity people are there to try to bring the business back online or resolve whatever issue it is. So, one of the things to expect is, and one of the things to guard against is burnout. So the key aspect there is making sure you take the time to do the learning and do the things that are going to help you further your career when those opportunities happen, when those opportunities are available and not um, get so caught up to where you don't take the time to do the things to ensure that you're taking care of yourself and your team members. Because it is a people first industry, right? People will take care of people. And one of the key things to expect in a career and demand from it, quite frankly, is that you know you're you're in a, a culture that recognizes that that encourages that continuous learning to take the time when you need the time and it really helps you uh, get to wherever you want to go to. So one of the key things where I talked about at the beginning, there's no winning the cyber war. Well, one of the things that you know for, that motivates me is ensuring that long after I'm gone, there's people that I've worked with, mentored, that have mentored me, that are still persisting and doing all the things they can do to help keep our way of life and, and ensure that, you know, when I, when, when I can't do the job anymore, they're going to protect me from the cyber attacks and privacy that would disrupt my way of life. And that's what really, to expect in a career, it could be that fulfilling. It becomes that deep of a, of a once, you, once you're engaged of thinking about the, the true why are we doing this, it's really important. And that's the part around putting, you know, it's all about the people. So we need to make sure that in doing, you know, in your, in your job, you know, it's not just what you can expect from the job, what should, the, what, what, do you, what should you demand from that environment and how can you create the community and help persist what we're trying to do, which is uh, defend our families and friends and our way of life. I'll, I'll add that many of the things that you can expect on the job are very, very boring and what you would expect for most jobs, right? You're going to be probably working remote uh, for, what, probably 95% of cybersecurity jobs right now, uh, which is maybe not ideal in getting to know new colleagues and very other, various other respects. But I think this has been a really key democratizer of access to talent. It doesn't really matter where you are physically. If you've got a good internet connection, you can pretty much work for any leading cybersecurity organization, whether that's a private sector security team or uh, a, a vendor or, or pretty much anyone else outside government and academia, which tend to have different standards. Uh, you can also expect to get too many emails. Uh, you can expect to spend too much time on Zoom, Teams, or God forbid, WebEx. Uh, and my thoughts and prayers are with you if you run, run into a company that still uses WebEx. Uh, and, uh, and you also are going to have colleagues in many cases that understand and value what you do and in any some other cases don't right there are uh there are some interesting dynamics that emerge around cybersecurity vis-a-vis -vis the business especially in the private sector 
because uh, cybersecurity was uh, somewhat, somewhat fairly known as the department of no in a lot of organizations. We're trying to tell people, oh, don't do that. Don't do that. That is too risky. Uh, most good cybersecurity professionals have figured out that everybody is in this together and you really do want to not be the police internally in terms of what people are doing from a technology perspective, but sometimes the job requires you to do that. So you're not always popular. Uh, that is something that uh, a lot of security leaders uh, have learned how to handle. Um, I do actually want to also kind of echo um, you know, the, uh, or actually respond to rather, uh, Jason's uh, question that he's asking here. If you, from the perspective of a hiring manager, what do you look for on an application for a director level cyber position? First of all, uh, having hired cybersecurity directors before, I look for an application. You know, if too few of them are coming in, right? If you're if you're breathing, you've got a pulse, you've got some uh, experience in cybersecurity, you have a leg up. You should absolutely try for this one. Um, at a director level, though, I think this is and this is something that is probably not going to apply to most of the attendees, but I think it's still worth mentioning. You do move from these entry level positions that look like SOC analyst, uh, incident responder, uh, awareness training coordinator, uh, all, all the way through on, on the vendor side, a whole host of different jobs, through to leadership positions where you're going to have to speak the language of the business in most cases in the private sector. That language is not cybersecurity technical. It's not, we have this many CVEs and they're classified with these, these CVSS scores and we haven't patched these uh, this percentage of them here in this business unit. Nobody cares, nobody understands at a certain level. So if you're getting to the director point and you're not purely on the security operations side of things, you should be thinking about how to talk about risk, how to think about a problem like ransomware, understand that, understand, well, how does it get in? What do we do if it does get in? And how would we prepare for something like that? Those are the sorts of kind of critical thinking oriented pieces that I would ask a director of cybersecurity to, to walk me through, like walk, walk me through your thought process. What do you think is important? Where do you think an organization should focus on a problem like that problem? And there's plenty of good discussion going on very publicly about challenges like ransomware that anybody can dip into. A huge amount of this happens, as I said before, on Twitter. Uh, follow some leading cybersecurity people there and you will get great exposure to some of the leading minds on those topics. So it's uh, it's it's definitely a, a job that, you know, it does get its own version of NCIS, but is still very, very boring in many of its aspects. And uh, it is still one, though, that does line up to really cool things where you can make a lot of progress in your career in a, in a very short period of time. Uh, just to throw out uh, maybe a bit of motivation for everyone. I know multiple people that have changed jobs two or three times during the pandemic and have basically doubled their salaries and their areas of responsibility each time. There's that much of a skills shortage. So as frustrating as it might be to try and get in the in the door here, given how hard we in the cybersecurity world make it, it is absolutely worth it. Excellent dialogue today. So we have about eight minutes left and we have a lot of good questions from our attendees. So I'd like to transition us to the question and answer portion of, of the today's panel session. So a lot of these questions are geared towards entering the cybersecurity marketplace. And the first one I would like to pass along to the panel members, and I'd like to also offer some advice on this one. The question is, what are the best ways to impress on an interview? And before turning it over to the panel members, I'd like to say, the best thing to do is to prepare for the interview and to anticipate what's known as behavioral based interviews with panels. A lot, a lot of the newer styles of interviewing aren't really geared towards talking about your resume. They're more geared towards asking you about some specific situations that you've been in during your career or during your, your educational experience. And one way to note some of the experiences are to Remember the acronym SAR SAR, which stands for Situation, Action, and Result. So, write down while you're preparing types of situations relative to cybersecurity that you've encountered, what action you took to address the situation, and what the results were. And kind of memorize these, and, and you'll be surprised how handy they come in when you're actually in the actual interview. So, panel members, any advice on best ways to impress on an interview? 
Well, one of the thing, one of the most important things I think is understanding who is interviewing you, and I don't mean necessarily the people that are sitting across the desk. However, that does help. But understand the company that you're actually applying to. Lots of people come in for an interview, and they sit there and they don't actually understand what the business of the company is and how the business operates. You know, cybersecurity is at that core of the business. We've seen how important it is. So actually understanding what the company is doing where they're doing it, how they're doing it. So understand their business. So you can talk about how to apply cybersecurity when you're talking about that situation or that scenario they're giving you. And you can talk about it in, in application of actually what they're doing. You, know, you might not know everything about how they're doing it or what they're doing, but you know, showing a good understanding, I think, is paramount. So understand who you're interviewing with. Any other advice on interviews before we well, move so to our next one? I mean, we're, we're all probably going to say something similar. It's really that situational awareness. I mean, understanding if you can, who you're interviewing with, go LinkedIn, Twitter, et cetera, and see if they're out there, what their digital eminence is, you know, how active they are, what their likes and dislikes are. Go and search on the company. You know, have they had a large cyber attack or breach in their past? Uh, maybe look at who their customers are, if they're a provider and, and the types of incidents they've had. It's really about having that situational awareness. But, and for us, you know, when, the, when we're looking at folks, it's really ensuring that person is going to want to continuously learn and be a team member. Because back to, there's obviously all people are welcome within the cybersecurity field. And we need to make sure that we do this as a team. There's going to be the people that are going to, be very technical. There's going to be the folks that need to interface with the technical folks to, to say, okay, here's what it means to the business. Kind of talking about, like Ryan mentioned, at director level, make sure that you're 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 not adding more mystery to it. You're demystifying it in those communications. And it's really looking at, you know, differentiating that you you want to learn something new and that you're willing to try new things because that's what in cybersecurity you cannot be afraid to fail, especially the defensive side. You know. It, it, you know, we are doing there. It's a tough job, and it takes uh, persistence. It takes an inquisitive mind. It takes uh, a team-oriented approach, and those are the types of things that need to come across an interview. Once you get through the door, depending on what the role is, you know, reference back to our. Do you have alphabet soup after your name based on all the certifications you have or not? Okay, I'm gonna to move to another question. We talked today about hundreds of thousands of jobs out there in the workforce. One of our attendees asked, if there are so many jobs, where do I apply and where do I find them? Good question. Uh, Self-interested, but we have 400 open uh, jobs at the moment, just at Proofpoint. I mean, the, the websites for cybersecurity companies is a great place to start. Reaching out to uh, people who are already in the industry who have said something you identify with, have you know, just sort of inspired you to connect in some way, shape, or form is another great way. But you're, you're right. You're sort of spoiled for choice right now when it comes to cybersecurity job openings. And the one piece of advice I would give is don't be limited by the job description. We, we're all very bad at writing those. So if it's a job you want to do, absolutely apply and the right sort of hiring manager will will absolutely give you a shot great answer and i'm going to limit since we only have a few minutes left the answers to our questions to one panel member please so uh, another good question everyone pretty much mentioned that education and background doesn't limit one from entering the cybersecurity field however when does it start to matter for example when you enter the workforce and you're pursuing a master's that isn't a master's in cyber, does that affect your entry into the field? So what does human resources look for when they're looking at candidates that are applying for roles in cyber? So if, if you're talking strictly from an HR perspective, right, they're gonna key off keywords. So like Ryan said, we do a poor job of writing descriptions sometimes, but if the description says master's required in cyber, whatever field you want to attach next to that, then yes, you might be not seen as a candidate. Meanwhile, the hiring manager may be say, well, okay, this person has a master's in something else. I still want to talk to them. They can still be a great fit for the team. And so it's all about 
it, it really varies. I mean, if it's something that you feel strongly about, reach out to that company, person, et cetera, direct, like, like Ryan mentioned earlier, direct message somebody and say, hey, I'm real interested. I see you're looking for our masters in this. I have this. I'm, but I, I think I'd be a great fit in, on, uh, on your team and in that role. So, you know, don't, don't be discouraged. And again, there's so, at times, there are not nearly enough applicants for the roles to where even if it does say something required and you don't quite have that, that, that you know, the requirements are that, hey, we really wish the person would have all these things. I can tell you for a fact, we don't get everything on our wish list when we're hiring people. <laughs> we, 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 we do the best we can, and then we want to make sure that we can get that person in and get them, get them going, get them the training they need, and get them integrated into the team. Okay, thank you. So we're going to have to wrap up. And before I do wrap up, I'd like to mention that Stay Safe Online will be hosting a Twitter chat this afternoon at 2 p.m. Eastern time. That should be of interest to many of you. And I'd like to conclude by thanking our insightful speakers, Mr. John Check from Raytheon, Mr. Tony Anscombe from ESET, and Mr. Ryan Kellenberg from Proofpoint. Thank you so much to all of our viewers for joining us today. As I mentioned at the beginning of today's webinar, the slides and a recording of this presentation will be available for download at our website, www.quantarian.com. So Quantarian Solutions is sharing additional cybersecurity career resources this week for National Cybersecurity Career Awareness Week. Please follow us on social media to stay up to date on those resources. So thank you once again for your time today. Best regards and everyone please stay well.